Ah, humans. So cute and cuddly. And we want to make sure they grow up and, and, and grow old and be free of disease and have a good life. To do this, we need to understand how these diseases are caused and how we can potentially repair our bodies so that they do work properly. The instructions for life are encoded in our DNA, so we need to know how the human genome is structured and how things can go wrong so we can try to fix them later. The draft genome, or the first pass um, of the human genome, was available in 2001. Uh, but it took quite a bit of time, uh, five years, in order to generate the second uh, draft human genome, which was available in 2006. Now, there are thousands of human genomes being generated every year. But the problem is, we can't really experiment with humans. So this is where model organisms come in. They allow us to perturb different genetic systems to observe the effects. So they allow us to experiment on them. They've been in use a really long time, but in 1996, the first model organism genome was sequenced, and this was yeast, which is, allows us to study unicellular eukaryotes. This was followed up by E. coli in 1997, C. elegans in 1998, and in 2000, two additional, much more complex genomes were actually um, sequenced. Now, all of this was occurring before the human genome was sequenced. Uh, but in 2000, you had Drosophila, which allowed us to study higher-order multicellular eukaryotes, and Arabidopsis, which allowed the study of plants, both two really important organisms um, to human health. Uh, following that, then we started sequencing, or the community started sequencing, more complex uh, organisms to study very specific things. For example, in 2002, the mouse genome was published, or was, was generated, and this has a much closer homology uh, to humans, and therefore a lot of disease genes are actually present in the mouse, and again, it allows for experimentation. Following that, the zebrafish genome in 2007 was sequenced. Uh, the zebrafish is an excellent organism to study development. And finally, well, not finally, there's many, many genomes out there, but in 2010, Xenopus was um, sequenced, and this is a very good organism for studying something like regeneration. So we've gotten to the point now where sequencing is cheap uh, and it's readily available, whole genome sequencing. And so now you can start asking very specific questions. You don't have to go to the mouse or you don't have to go to these other organisms. This allows just ordinary researchers, such as myself, to be able to uh, start asking more detailed questions about how the genome is structured and how this correlates to its function. And so this brings us to Formia regina and to me. Formia regina, also known as a blowfly, is an insect that has developed a very keen sense of smell. It's very, very good at detecting certain smells. And what it does is it detects decomposition odors does so so well that it can do it within 15 minutes of death. In the field, I have seen it even faster than that. Um, we use pigs as human surrogates, and when we put a pig out in the field, it usually takes no time at all for the flies to show up. The female will specifically detect this dead animal. Uh, sometimes those are humans. And then she'll lay her eggs on it so her offspring, the maggots, uh, can eat the tissue to develop. So this is what they need in order to develop from the egg to the adult fly. They have to eat vertebrate tissue. Once they've eaten a, a certain amount, once they've reached their developmental thresholds, then they leave the body and they find a safe place to pupate. Um, so this is so they can go undergo metamorphosis. And they'll emerge as a fly and start all over again. So the cycle starts anew. The entire time for that is between three weeks and a month. It's dependent on temperature because uh, insects are pocleothermic, which means that they're regulated by the outdoor temperature. Uh, they're cold-blooded, basically. Now, these flies are particularly useful in forensic investigations because they can act as a clock. They will come in and lay eggs after the individual has died, which means the minimum post-mortem interval, or the time between the discovery of the body and when the individual was dead, or the minimum time needed for that, um, correlates to the age of the insect that is discovered on the body. So if you can figure out how old the maggot is, you can work backwards and get this minimum post-mortem interval. 
This um, very briefly describes the field of forensic entomology. Typically, forensic entomologists are called in well after the fact, um, so they're not around at the collection time, uh, usually when the body is discovered, although that would be ideal, and they are responsible for typically supporting or busting alibis because what we do is we come in and we talk about the time of death, and this is usually in decomposition cases, so a, some amount of time has gone by, so it's not usually just one day. Because uh, uh, after one day of death, there are physiological methods that can be used to determine the postmortem interval. Um, but once a few days have gone by, and if the body is outdoors, anything like that, then the blowflies tend to be the most useful. So you collect your maggots. Um, this will be the only gross picture I show you. And you won't be working with maggots at all. But you collect your maggots from, um, from a body, for instance, when it was discovered. And you figure out how old it is. And then typically you're called to go testify to this age. And you do so using scientific principles. And we know that there's a correlation between how large the maggot is and the amount of time that has gone by. But there's lots and lots of variation. So I just told you about these insects that come in and they lay eggs after the body has died, immediately following death. Uh, very, very good at that. Well, not all of them do that. And there are some bad girls in the forensic science um, or in the forensic entomology world. And particularly, there's two uh, genera of flies that, are, that can cause some problems. You have the screw worm flies and the sheet blow flies. The screw worm flies, the one at the top over here on the left, this fly is present in North America. Uh, down below it, is its sister species or counterpart, it has been eradicated from North America. Now the one on the bottom is the really bad one. This one causes a lot of problems. Um, and what these females will do is if there's a wound on an animal, they'll come in and they'll lay eggs on that wound. And the maggots will, once they hatch from the eggs, will start to eat, of course, the dead tissue. But they don't stop there. They then begin eating the live tissue. There's an advantage to, to having this type of behavior because if you get to the animal before it dies, then there's no competition for it. So you'll definitely, your offspring will definitely develop. Um, the one at the top I told you is present in, South, in North America, um, but it actually doesn't cause that many problems. And we're not exactly sure why because they're quite related to each other and it does cause some problems in South America. On the right side of the screen are the sheep blowflies. Both of these species, you've got Lucilia cuprina and Lucilia sericata on the bottom, are present in North America. In fact, these species are present all over the world. But depending on where you are in the world, they cause different problems. And again, they, as, as, as their name might entail, um, are attracted to sheep in particular. And in countries with a lot of sheep farming, they cause a lot of problems. So what they cause is, it's called myiasis, or it's the infestation of live tissue um, with, by fly larvae or by fly maggots. Now, coincidentally, this one uh, species on the bottom left here, Lucilia sericata, is actually the species that's used for maggot therapy here in North America. Maggot therapy being if you have a wound that has um, a lot of bacterial infection in it, um, oftentimes uh, some of these antibiotics just won't work. For instance, any of these uh, resistant bacteria uh, can cause major problems, can often lead to something like amputation. Well, what you can do is you can actually put this species on the wound, these maggots that have been raised sterilely, and they have some antibiotic um, enzymes that are present in their, in their spit, so to speak, when they're digesting. And this helps clean the wounds. In fact, does so much better than any surgical removal of potential tissue. And they're pretty good because they won't touch the live tissue. However, if you go outside of North America, that cannot be guaranteed. So the main question that I am interested in um, is how did this happen? How do these species decide whether or not they're going to eat live tissue or dead tissue? Because physiologically there's a very big difference between the two, which means they had to have evolved um, this type of behavior. And so I'm interested in trying to study what that evolutionary process was. So, but we're going to go back here to formia for a second. To why formia? When you study human diseases, you don't start with a diseased individual and see how 
healthy individuals compare. What you want to do is you want to start with a healthy individual and then so you can figure out all of the variation that's present in the genome all ready to start off with that doesn't contribute to the disease and then compare the diseased individual. That's why it's important for us to start with a healthy or in this case it's a wild type um, fly, get its genome and work from there. So what we're doing is we're starting by getting a really good reference genome for a closely related fly, which is Formia regina, that doesn't cause any problems, and we're going to work from there. Um, so that's the whole um, process for um, why we're interested in studying this fly. Now, how do you get a genome? You've probably learned this in some of your classes already, but it's pretty simple. Uh, you start with the entire complement of the genome, and you fragment it. So you cut it up into smaller pieces. And this is random, so you cut it up somewhat random, unless you're using enzymes, but you cut it up into various um, sized pieces, and then you adapt or you ligate adapters onto each piece of fragment. Now, you don't know any of these sequences of the DNA, so what you want to do is add in DNA for which you know the sequences too, so that way you can do something like PCR amplification or there's lots of different um, strategies involved for sequencing. And then there's some other steps that are involved, so you have to do some size selection. But the purpose, or the point is, is that you end up with millions of differently sized frag or of fragments that get sequenced. And then the next step, this is the difficult step, sequencing is not difficult, but you take all of these little tiny chunks and you want to put them together, see what matches, what chunks overlap with each other, and so that you can eventually put a genome together. So we've got um, over, uh, I think it's 750 billion reads, which is more than a gillion base pairs of DNA uh, um, information we have in our lab right now. And the idea is to try to put all of that information together so that we can recreate what the individual chromosomes are in the fly. And the fly has five chromosomes and an X and Y chromosome for sex determination. And a particular question that we're interested in looking at for this project, for this class, is to find, see whether or not we can find genetic markers that are present on these X and Y chromosomes um, so that we can have a test for sex. This is a very simple um, uh, genetic test for which we don't have in blowflies because we don't have any of this genomic information. So your, um, your task is to see whether or not some of these putative um, SNPs or indels that we've discovered in our genome actually are associated or relate to the X and Y chromosomes. Uh, and you'll do that by comparing some of these sequences to what's known in Drosophila. Drosophila is a very good, uh, well annotated genome uh, with some degree of homology to our flies. So we can get this sort of first pass of information. But we have 10,000 of these potential or putative markers, sex markers. And going through 10,000 markers one by one is a very difficult task for a single individual. But as a group, this is an excellent um, plan. So anyone who comes up with a really compelling um, or really good target for validation, which we can do in my lab, which you're more than welcome to come and do if you would like to do in my research lab, uh, certainly, whichever group comes up with the magical uh, sex marker, I will take out to dinner. So with that, I'll um, end this presentation. It was a very brief introduction to uh, what my research is looking into and what your uh, goal is in this uh, next exercise. I wish you all luck, and I can't wait to see you.